Hello and welcome. I'm Kelly Stremmel with McKenzie Worldwide. Today we are kicking off the PKI Solutions webinar series. And today we'll be talking about quantum readiness. I'd like to introduce you to Mark Cooper. He's president and founder of PKI Solutions. You may know him as the PKI guy. He has deep knowledge of public key infrastructure, identity management, and authentication. PKI Solutions provides consulting and training and works with enterprises around the world. Now, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Kelly. Well, today we're going to start by talking about some of the aspects around quantum computing. And we're going to really kind of start by looking at the current myth. What are we hearing in the news, in the media, and what's the messaging about quantum computing and the impact to you as an enterprise? We're going to talk a little bit about the history of crypto. It's not going to be a deep dive, so don't worry too much. But we'll talk a little bit about where did we come from and, and why is this such a monumental shift for the industry and, frankly, the encryption world as a whole. We'll talk about how you can survive this post-quantum world, what some of the things that you can do to prepare for that in situation, as well as what you can do for your enterprise to ready for that post-quantum state. We'll also talk about third parties. Most of us are dealing with providers that are cloud-based, external vendors, or even managed services. And it's really critical that we make sure that when we look at the, the quantum and the encryption problem, that we make sure that we are addressing this part of our enterprise. We're also going to take a few moments and answer some of the most common questions we're getting in this space. So let's start with the myth. We're definitely seeing a lot of information that's communicated in the internet as well as directly to us about what is coming in regards to post-quantum. Now, most of what we're seeing out there is information that the world is going to end, that quantum computers are suddenly going to come into existence. Everything that we do with computers is suddenly going to break and organizations are going to be left with really no solution to manage their private information. Now, some of this is based on truth and some of it is simply messaging that is being squeezed into very small places. When we talk about quantum computers, there's a couple of different things that are going on. Yes, there is the research and development work that's being done with quantum computers. Yes, we will see an impact that's coming down the road, but Frankly, what we're dealing with when it comes to cryptography is some theoretical threats against encryption. However, it's reasonably certain that these things are going to happen. When we take a look at what the quantum concern is, is essentially quantum computers are theorized to be able to break encrypted information. That essentially means that quantum computers present the greatest modern threat that we've ever had to computers and privacy. Quantum cryptography should have the ability to take encrypted information as well as signing, because frankly, signing is just an amalgamation of hashing and signatures going into an identity will be affected by post-quantum cryptography as well. So when we really look at this, we need to make sure that we're taking a little bit of the messaging around quantum computers and dissecting out what's really going to happen. But the fact is they are coming the biggest unknown is how soon. No one really knows that. So we're going to try to move on a little bit from the myth and talk about some of the things that you should be aware of and some of the things that you could do to prepare for post-quantum. And here's the other thing that we tried to do in this session is we really wanted to make sure that what we were going to give you from a task perspective provided value, whether you think quantum computers and quantum supremacy are around the corner tomorrow or whether they're coming 20 years down the road. So what is the impact? No one really knows for sure. There's a good number of theories that are out there as far as what the impact of quantum computers and encryption and signature is going to be. What we know is that quantum computers should be able to solve a very discrete problem that has essentially allowed us to encrypt and sign information for quite some time. Now, some really interesting things are under the cover when we look at modern day encryption, and we'll cover that in an, uh, the next slide. But what we should really come to take away from this point is the fact that at some point in our future, 
quantum computers will probably get to the point where they will be able to affect our encryption and our signature process. What we have to do as security professionals is figure out if that's something I want to prepare for now, or if I'm too much of a pessimist and I believe that's gonna to happen too far in the future. Frankly, every organization is going to have to figure out what their risk tolerance is. Now, the really interesting thing here is the fact that you really can't ignore this problem. It's not as easily dismissed as, say, the Y2K problem. When we look back and we look at Y2K, it was all mostly financial and banking sector, old code that had dates that were based on two-digit codes. Many organizations could look and say, all my software is newer. I'm not in that space. I don't have to worry about that. That's not really the case here. Most organizations have something somewhere that is encrypting or doing signing, whether it's TLS type of traffic, VPN solutions, some type of tunneling, or even database systems. They're all doing some type of encryption in your environment. So you really don't have the option of ignoring this problem because it's there. The biggest problem you're gonna have is finding out where is the information? What are you using? The other thing that you need to take into account is trying to figure out what pieces of information do you have about how you're encrypting and how you're signing in your environment. The biggest challenge that you're going to face is trying to figure out what these systems are. We're gonna talk a little bit about tracking these systems down and how to determine their applicability in a post-quantum world but the biggest challenge is going to be trying to fill in this information. So let's start with a little bit of the state of quantum computers. What we know right now is that quantum computers themselves aren't going to spell the end of encryption. Encryption will always be needed. There will be some type of encryption and signing that will be feasible in a post-quantum world. What we do know is that based on current understanding that the type of encryption that we do and the type of signing operations are not protected against quantum computers. So we know that we're going to have to be in the process of finding and determining new algorithms that will be usable to protect ourselves against quantum computers. Now, I, I often like to think back to an, an old story that we would hear about IBM that once said that they believe that the world only has a need for about 12 computers. Now, an interesting thing that's happening in the quantum space is there's a lot of discussion around how many quantum computers will there be, who will have access to them, will they replace your everyday desktop? And we probably won't see quantum computers in everybody's desktop. But I think if history teaches us anything, is we'll probably not be right when we think about how many quantum computers there are. It's not likely that there'll just be a few of them in universities and a few in governments. We now have things like cloud computing and even companies like Microsoft are already talking about how they want to take quantum computers and provide web-based access to them cloud access, quantum computing on demand. So we already know that the old physical limitations of how many organizations can afford a quantum computer, or in the case of IBM, how many can afford a mainframe, just won't have the same parallels. So we know that the accessibility of quantum computers will be much more prevalent than we've had in the past. And that means, frankly, the access to break information, whether it's encryption or signing, will be much greater than we've had in the past as well. Now, since we know that quantum computers are still under development, we know that we can take some steps to protect ourselves today. We know that this isn't going to be a threat that happens overnight, but frankly, we don't know if this is months or years away. And frankly, it could be one or both. And just because we hear about what organizations, institutions, government, and research facilities are doing with quantum computers, we can't be complacent and assume that's the only activity that's happening with quantum computers. We know that governments are gonna be very interested in being able to break encryption, whether it's against an adversary or for their own intelligence gathering. We can assume that there's probably many things happening in the quantum space that we won't hear about publicly for quite some time. So we need to begin planning now how our organization is going to be prepared for the post-quantum world. And there's a few things that you can begin doing today to make sure that you take the right steps. The other thing that makes post-quantum computing a threat compared to Y2K 
is the fact that Y2K was something that we could put a pin in the calendar, know exactly when it was going to affect us, and begin working backwards from that date to make sure that we began to remediate the problem in time. With post-quantum, we don't really know when this date is coming. So no one is really seeing the pressure to begin making a change because there's no set deadline for this. To make the story a little more complicated is the fact that just because post-quantum encryption is going to be down the road and quantum computing may have the ability to break encryption at any day, well, even if that's five years down the road, if I'm transferring and storing information in an encrypted state today, that could be gathered and harvested for future access. Just because it's encrypted today doesn't mean it can't be decrypted down the road. Once a quantum computer comes along, if the information that it harvested is something that could be decrypted in the future and it still has value, that could impact my organization. So we should already be thinking about what type of information are we transmitting? How long is it useful if it was captured and decoded in the future? And what can we begin doing today to protect that information? So you really should be working on a roadmap or a zero day timeline. What is going to be your process to get from where you are today to a point where your quantum cryptography risks have been identified and remediated? If you can determine what those systems are and how long it will take you to remediate those, even if you are going on a slow path, you at least know that those problems can be addressed in a certain amount of time in the future six months, two years, five years down the road. And then as the state of quantum computing changes, you'll have a sense for where you are in that roadmap and how much longer you need to resolve the problem. So let's just take a brief history at the most common type of encryption that we see on the internet today. And that's based on RSA encryption. It was discovered in the public space in 1976, and it really is the most common type of encryption in the world. Asymmetric encryption that is based on public and private keys is what underpins everything from identity certificates to web TLS certificates, IPsec, and the most common type of traffic that is going across networks today. There's certain amount of inherent value in asymmetric encryption in the fact that I don't have to worry about storing symmetric keys for long periods of time in a password vault or a, a vaulting solution. With public and private key pairs, all I have to worry about is keeping my private key private. The public key is typically included in something like an X509 certificate inside of a P PKI infrastructure but the private key is the only one I have to maintain and I don't have to worry about transmitting it. Now, we've also seen some shifts in history when it comes to crypto. Things like MD5 and SHA-1 are no longer in use when they come to hashing algorithms. And that shift from SHA-1 to SHA-256 is probably what most people have experience with as the industry was making a change in the cryptography space. Now, it's a very different type of problem compared to the quantum computing threat. The move from SHA-1 to SHA-2 took way longer than it should have. In the early 2000s, NIST in the U.S. began recommending a move away from SHA-1 and in fact said that as of 2010, SHA-1 should no longer be used. But we really didn't see widespread changes in the web PKI space until 2018 or 2019, almost a decade after it was recommended that it should no longer be used. And it was only because of external forces from the CA browser forum that really encouraged the web PKI to move away from SHA-1. Now, all that really dealt with was a theoretical attack against SHA-1. In 2008, 2009, when the recommendation came out, there was no demonstrated attack against SHA-1. It was theorized that as SHA-1 was being evaluated, that in the next couple of years, there was going to be threats against SHA-1, and we needed to move away from it before those threats were realized. It wasn't until 2018 that a very deliberate type of attack was first demonstrated against SHA-1 almost a decade later. And even that was a very limited type of attack against SHA-1. 
Since that time, the process has been refined more, and we're seeing more and more weaknesses discovered in SHA-1. SHA-1 only dealt with identity of information. SHA-1 was not used to encrypt or keep private information private. When things were signed with SHA-1, we were simply indicating who created a message or what identity. So there's a threat there. But when we look at encryption itself, the amount of data that is encrypted and stored from banking to privacy to customer information is vast. And the intent of encrypting information is generally to prevent it from being read. With quantum computing, we're essentially talking about the near instantaneous ability to read that information, not just a theoretical attack against who made the information. So it's a very significant impact. The other thing that's going on is right now, the size of the quantum computing overall abilities is relatively small. Quantum computers are measured in qubits, the number of different computational bits of the quantum computing. There's a lot of challenges to get to a point where quantum computers will actually be able to break things like RSA encryption. So it's not like those qubits exist today. The sizes of the quantum computers are just simply too small. There's a lot of challenges around noise and temperature control and the overall infrastructure of quantum computing to get it to a point where it will actually be able to represent a threat. Right now, NIST assumes that somewhere around 2030 that a new standard will be needed. Now, the important thing to keep in mind with NIST is they are don't have a magic crystal ball. They are simply trying to make projections based on current trends and changes in the industry. And that update is on an as needed basis. So we may see an update to that 2030 timeframe at the middle of 2020 or 2025 that may shift that timeline forward or back. So the, the state of quantum computing um, has not only technical challenges, but one of the other things that's going on is we're still not entirely sure how to talk to a quantum computing. And it reminds me of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. They build a, the largest computer in the universe and they ask it, what's the meaning of life, universe, and everything? And it comes back and says 42. Turns out they asked it the wrong question. Still today, there's still debate on whether the quantum computers that exist are just really fast computers or if they're able to do something that only a quantum computer can do. So we're still left in, how do we ask a question of a quantum computer that only a quantum computer can answer? So it's still in its infancy. However, we don't really know if this problem will be solved in the short term and we're facing a major shift in encryption as quickly as 2020 or soon after. So now that we've covered a little bit of the history, let's talk about what you could be doing today. And what we tried to do was provide you with some things that you could begin to do to prepare for post-quantum. But frankly, this is something you should do regardless of your concern about quantum computing. This is all about knowing what assets you have in your organization that are doing encryption and signing. And eventually, we'll even see moves from RSA 2048 to 3K or 4K sizes, or even SHA-2 to something like a SHA-3. That may happen before quantum computing comes along. Well, the same information that's going to be needed to address those issues is the same thing that we need to address the quantum issue. So let's just look at this as what should we be doing with our encryption and signing assets that we always talk about doing, but we don't do. The first thing that you want to do is you need to figure out what assets, what systems do you have in your environment, whether they are appliances, software, operating systems that are doing something with encryption or signing and figure out what types of keys are they doing? Are they using RSA, elliptical curve? Are they doing symmetric keys? Are they doing some type of hashing, MD5 or SHA-1? Now, that sticking point number one uh, often turns into a debate with some of our customers as far as how do we do that? How do we figure out what all of these systems are? Well, you won't always know. Most organizations don't have a really clear list of what systems are inside of their environment. Well. One of the things that we say is if you're a relatively small organization, you may actually be able to look around, point to things, even look at what you've contracted from a cloud provider space and say, here's our 30, 50 different systems that we have. The odds are 
that's not going to be as easy for you. So let's figure out how to make this problem a little easier. So you can start by figuring out what are your business critical systems? What are the things that help you as an organization run? You may have a dozen or two dozen of those systems if you're a bank and you are able to identify the things that allow your ATMs to work. You can do cash transfers. You can do teller services. That's business critical. If you have an employee website that sells tickets to Disneyland for employees, that's probably not as critical. It's something you should look at down the road, but figure out what those critical systems are. Sometimes we even get pushback on that. So I'll say, find what you can. If you are going to be the evangelist in your organization, or even if you're the CISO, and you can't even figure out what those business critical systems are, start with what you can see. Look at your desktop, look at the systems that you know that do exist, and put them into a tracking system, a spreadsheet, a Word document, something. Start with what you can see. Then as you gather this information and you evangelize it with others, you'll be able to add more things. And maybe you're only able to identify a dozen things today, and then next month you're able to add one or two more things that's still going in the right direction. So in addition to trying to figure out what these systems are and what keys they have, we also want to figure out what our risk exposure is, figure out where they are placed, something that's on our external facing internet, facing a unprotected firewalled environment, or maybe it's sitting inside of your DMZ where it has some protection or some internal website. These have very different risk exposures. If we know that a quantum computer comes online next month, all of the systems that are facing the internet, I really have to assume are going to be at risk. I won't really know if somebody's using a quantum computing based algorithm to take a look at my information. So I have to assume that anything that's externally accessible or exposed is going to have a higher risk. Now, I may have some internal systems that are just as high of a risk. If I have VPN systems that allow people to remotely connect, or if my core business has applications, those may be ranked higher than systems that aren't as exposed or aren't as important to the business. So this is a subjective risk exposure, but try to identify something unique. If you simply say appliance A and it has RSA keys and that's all you have in your spreadsheet, you don't know if that's something you wanna remediate day one or if that's the last thing for you to remediate. So try to assign some type of exposure and risk to it. We also want to figure out, do those systems have some type of crypto upgrade option? Perhaps there's already capabilities within that software, that operating system, that appliance to upgrade the cryptography that's used. Some systems have crypto agility where we can plug in new types of cryptographic algorithms without changing anything about the software. There may be the ability to plug in a third party cryptographic provider and provide improved protection. We may find that the manufacturer has a new version of their product, but the one that we have doesn't have crypto agility or a way of upgrading the cryptography. That's an important thing to note. If there's no upgrade, if you take a look at the device and there's no upgrade within the device, there's nothing in their timeline, begin to discuss with the manufacturer what their plans are. Just because you are one customer and you've got one of their appliances, if you and your colleagues that use that device don't contact the manufacturer, they're never going to hear how much their customers are looking at this. So when you find things that aren't going to fit your cryptographic needs as it relates to quantum or even just the RSA, ECC, SHA-2 space, begin having conversations with the manufacturer and ask them what their timelines are to provide the ability to upgrade cryptographic providers. The other thing is if you have those discussions or the manufacturer doesn't exist, there's no upgrade, you need to begin looking for alternative solutions now. If you're not gonna be upgrading the system and the manufacturer can't commit to a timeline, it may make sense to find what other solutions can you use. Do they have a competitor? Is there some other box or some other piece of software that will give me a more defined timeline or better cryptography to protect myself? 
the reason that we're doing this early on is it may take a while to find those alternative solutions. So if you think about your spreadsheet where we've tracked these systems, what the risk exposure is, you can have a nice little column that says, do we know what an alternative solution is? And then you know the areas that you need to be investigating and researching options in the environment. We also want to figure out what is our timeline as far as our ability to implement quantum resistant algorithms. So if we know a device has a, a upgradable cryptographic system or if there's some type of alternative solution, how long is it going to take us to implement that quantum resistant algorithm? The reason for that is we need to know whether that's going to be a long-term process that we need to begin now, or is this something that is fairly easy for us to do that if news reports come out tomorrow that quantum supremacy have been reached, that we can flip a switch and everything switches over. So we really need to understand what's the timeline for this. The other thing is we need to go through and we need to spend a little bit of time thinking about those critical and vulnerable systems. What are the things that aren't going to be upgradable, that are external facing, that are business critical? How can we go about addressing those systems when we don't have any readily addressable solution, either through upgrading the cryptography, finding an alternate solution, or implementing a quantum resistant algorithm? Those remaining systems are going to have to be addressed in some way. We also need to be thinking about our cloud providers and our solution providers. Most of us are not in a situation anymore where all of our systems are sitting inside of our physical premise, inside of a data center where we can walk aisle to aisle and point to everything that is touching our data. The cloud world is one where a lot of our services are either being hosted in public clouds, private clouds, or even service providers and vendors that are holding or processing our data. We need to make sure that we reach out to these partners and have discussions with them about how are they protecting our information? How is it transferred to them in a encrypted or signing state? And how are they protecting our information when it's in their hands? Then what are they doing when it regards to quantum computing? What is their ta timeline to either implement post-quantum resistant algorithms or come up with alternate solutions and expose that information to you so you know what your risk exposure is with those partners. Because you may find that some of the providers aren't even looking at this space. And if you begin having those conversations today, if they're not willing to engage in the conversation, then they're probably not very interested in your business or your data, and you can begin looking for other solutions. But you need to make sure that we're thinking about not just our on-premise solutions, but anywhere that we're interfacing and using data today. So a couple of key questions to ask yourself and to have internally when you think about quantum computing. We need to think a little bit about the systems that can't be upgraded or somehow improved to have some type of a operational state. There's some interesting things that we can do. Let's just say that we have a business critical system and in our environment, it can't be upgraded. It's a uh, source code's missing. It's the thing that makes our widget. No one else has a system that can make our widget. It's gonna be 10 years before we can replace this thing. It's not going away. And it just happens to be using RSA encryption and it has to be facing the internet. So what can we do about it? Well, one of the novel things that we can do is look at augmenting the system rather than replacing it or plugging something in. Well, if we can augment it by making it secure, even though it is inherently insecure. And what I mean by that is if that widget maker communicates across the internet, well, what if I take that communications traffic and wrap it inside of something that is quantum resistant? So I can go out and buy someone else's solution that does nothing but encrypt traffic over an IPsec session from one place to the other. And I put that between my widget maker and data center A and my widget maker and data center B. And even though they're gonna talk inherently insecurely, if I put that through a pipe that is protected, then the information as it transverses over the internet is going to be quantum resistant. Yes, I'm doubly encrypting things, but I'm making sure that it is quantum resistant. So there are some things that we can do around augmentation to make sure that those systems that can't be readily upgradable can be upgraded. 
The other thing that we need to think about is if we do have the ability to place in new quantum algorithms, are our systems flexible enough to work with that? Meaning if I take my new firewall or a, a new application and I plug in that new quantum algorithm, is everything that talks to that system going to understand that new algorithm? Most of the time, we're not just standing up a single computer or a single server to do something. Other things talk to it. Web browsers, network communications, other applications. We need to make sure that those systems are also able to understand those new quantum algorithms so that they can successfully transmit information. We need to think about what types of practices or controls we have in our organization that need to change. Think about things like your procurement process. If we already know that we're collecting and evaluating information about cryptography, we should make sure that our procurement process or RFP, our, our software and appliance vendor onboarding process, that we're asking these questions so that as you're evaluating new systems and new appliances, you're not buying something that is immediately going to become obsolete when it comes to the post-quantum world. So already, begin to ask those questions of new systems coming in. We can also look at things for what about bring your own key and other types of solutions. If you're able to implement newer types of hardware security modules or new types of controls where you're able to create and store your own key, will you have the ability to affect some of these encryption limitations that you'll find with other vendors? It's possible that by using your own key, you're, over, you're able to overcome some of the limitations that you may find in some of these other solutions. And the other thing is figure out what your zero day timeline is. How long will it take you to get from today to a point where you are ready for quantum supremacy? How long to mitigate each of the solutions, replace systems, and then at that point you'll know how long is it going to take you to solve a problem. Let's say your timeline is two years. That means that if tomorrow quantum supremacy is announced, you have to assume that for the next two years, your information is going to be vulnerable because there'll be no way of knowing that your information is protected. Are you okay doing what you do today, knowing that every place where you used to assume that identities and data was adequately protected is going to be exposed for the next two years? And the odds are probably not. That means you are going to want to make sure that you start replacing those systems two years before quantum supremacy is achieved. Now, if you've been listening all along, you would realize no one knows the data that's going to begin. So if we know it's two years, we start today and quantum supremacy happens five years from now, guess what? You don't have to worry. You got it done in two years. The next three years, you're going to be maintaining your readiness for quantum supremacy. There's nothing that's going to be exposed. If you have a timeline that's anything more than instantaneous, there will be some point in time where your data is exposed to quantum computers. So a couple of things in surviving in this world. We've talked a little bit about tracking this information. It's a really big problem to go out and collect these details. It really is information collection. You don't have to necessarily start anywhere else. But it really is something that we need to make sure that we are staying diligent in this space. We need to make sure that we're monitoring and we're evaluating what's happening in the quantum computing space on a regular basis. We're not seeing updates every night or every week, but it's something that is rapidly changing. We want to make sure that if we're starting a project or we just made a decision that we're going to work on this next quarter, that things don't suddenly start shifting underneath us in regards to quantum computers. So make sure you're being diligent about keeping up with what's happening in the space. The other thing is we need to make sure that we are ready to adopt new types of cryptographic algorithms as they are available. NIST is currently going through a recommendation selection phase. There are third parties that are outside of the NIST space. You have options to look at available algorithms and begin implementing them today, whether you want to follow the NIST recommendations or not. But you can prepare to figure out where and how you're going to implement these. Lastly, take a look at your partners, suppliers, and vendors. Make sure that they're following the same thing. Make sure that they're keeping up with their timeline commitments to you and their timelines and commitments as well. 
And lastly, don't worry. All of this will get sorted out, but the best thing that you can do is not panic, figure out where you can start to solve this problem today and go forward. Well, thank you, Mark. I wanted to uh, um, communicate some questions that we've been getting lately. Um, so what industries are at the most risk when it comes to quantum? Well, an interesting thing that, that we see is that this really isn't necessarily something that's isolated to, to one industry. I, I mentioned earlier that Y2K was something that a lot of people could dismiss if they were outside of the financial or banking sector. Uh, just about every industry today is using encryption or signing in some way in their business. But we can generally say that anyone that is uh, storing information either for customers in the financial space, healthcare, uh, technology, or even in the manufacturing space where you may have something proprietary, there is most likely a very high probability that somebody's going to be interested in your information. The, the reality is just because a quantum computer is capable of breaking encryption doesn't necessarily mean somebody's going to look at your stuff. But if you are the holder of information where people are constantly trying to find details, somebody is going to be very motivated to take that new tool of a quantum computer and look at your data. Mm, that's a good point. Um, here, here's another question. So um, resources are an issue at my organization. What are the top things that we should be doing now to prepare? So it, this comes up. Every organization is, is already busy with a thousand other fires and, and to kind of start talking about something that may or may not happen tomorrow is, is a difficult one. What I say is if, if you're listening to this webinar or you come across this content, you, you have some interest here. And an organization can start with one single evangelist that, that wants to do something that could start today. You don't need a massive project team. You don't need a massive um, uh, outsource provider scanning through all of your code like Y2K. This can start with you. Uh, figure out the systems you're responsible for. Begin creating that, that sheet of what types of keys you have and the crypto agility and begin evangelizing it, sharing it with your colleagues and others within the company uh, and adding information where you can. The, the other thing is a lot of the details that you need isn't necessarily a, a, a force multiplier of, of colleagues to figure out what your system is capable of doing. Sometimes it's a matter of just looking through the UI of the product or consulting the documentation or, or opening a support case with the manufacturer. So sometimes just allowing um, the information that may already be there about that system can, can really help you um, go down the road. And then lastly is there's a lot of people that are tracking what's happening in the quantum space. You don't have to do a lot of research or interpretation for yourself. Find a trusted source, figure out how they are tracking the, the quantum computing updates, and make sure that you check in with them regularly. You don't have to go into all the latest academic reports, but make sure that you have found a place where you're able to check in and allow them to do the heavy lifting for you. Here's another question. Can you please comment on the recommendations in CNSA, former Suite B, in relation to quantum preparedness? Is RSA 2048 not adequate? Um, well, right, right now, the, the best that NIST can really do is, is have a little bit of a crystal ball to, to, to try to figure out where uh, quantum supremacy is, is likely to, to reign. As of today, nothing's really changed in the immediate recommendations from NIST. It's, it's still uh, RSA 2048 uh, at, at a minimum, uh, SHA-256 or technically SHA-224 um, on, on a signature side. It's still considered uh, acceptable commercial practices, but it is, it is the bottom of the barrel. Uh, there is expectations that those key sizes and, and hashing algorithms will continue to grow. Uh, but at this point, NIST hasn't really pinpointed the date for a transition. Uh, there's not even necessarily a, um, uh, an, an algorithm that's been selected by NIST to uh, migrate to. So it, it, it's on their, their roadmap, but there really isn't a, a, a set of um, encryption and, and signature algorithms you can move to today. It really is about preparedness. 
Okay, thank you. Here's another question. Do you think Microsoft, IBM, Google, etc. will be selective in who they allow to purchase time on the quantum computing web time? <laughs> <laughs> I think they'll be selective if you've got an account or a credit card and you're, and you're willing to pay the, the, the charge. Um, what, what we've seen with any other type of, of services, you, you know, everything can potentially be put to uh, malicious use. And, you know, we, we've certainly seen from computing resources and communications that the, the inherent belief is, is that you're up to um, something that's legitimate until you've proven otherwise. So I don't necessarily expect these cloud providers to, to do some type of uh, vetting and verification of who's using their, their quantum computing resources. Uh, if you're paying your bills and uh, you're, you're crunching away, they really honestly shouldn't have an idea of whether you're sitting there trying to uh, uh, crack uh, large prime numbers or you're doing some molecular uh, healthcare research. That, honestly, they shouldn't know what kind of data you're working with. Um, but in, in short, no, I, I don't think they are going to be selective. A dollar is a dollar. Right. Good point. Here's another question about HSMs. And um, someone commented, could keys be generated and stored in HSM to resolve this issue? So the HSMs are actually uh, not uh, really changing the scenario at all. So if, if we think about what an HSM is responsible for doing is it's the cryptographic engine that um, is providing some random number generation. It's creating the, uh, the, the, the prime numbers that are used to create the, the private and the corresponding public key. And then when cryptographic operations uh, occur, they happen inside of the HSM. But in order for asymmetric encryption to work, the, the other side of the, the party has to have the public key that goes along with that. So that's either inside of a certificate that's shared, such as a TLS certificate, or it's exchanged as part of that uh, communications process. When we talk about quantum supremacy and, and breaking encryption, it's all because uh, essentially the public key is really just a factor of the private key. If you can take the public key and factor the two prime numbers that were used to multiply together to get the public key, you now know the private key. It doesn't matter that the private key was generated or stored or processed inside of an HSM and theoretically shouldn't move. It hasn't moved. We have just recomputed what the private key is. And, and that's really why there's a significant challenge here. It doesn't matter how secure you keep that private key. It's directly related to the public key. And if I can reverse engineer your private key, then an HSM doesn't make any difference. Okay, can you, here's another question. Can you talk a little bit more about symmetric encryption algorithms? Sure, so symmetric is actually nice in that um, the, the current uh, model says that AES-256, one of the most common types of symmetric keys, um, it is likely to be uh, impervious to quantum computers. The, the, the whole issue here is something called Shor's algorithm, which really goes about how can we figure out what the private key is that corresponds to a public key, the asymmetric side of things. Symmetric is a single um, a code, whether it's a password or a passphrase, whatever you want to call it, that encrypts and decrypts the information. Uh, that in itself, the, the code should never be exposed. So, so there is no function to have a quantum computer to go against. Really, its only option is to brute force it, meaning to take that data and to sit there and churn and try to figure out what the password is. That's very different than factoring. Factoring is here's the public key, figure out the two numbers that were used to be multiplied together to get it. That, that's, that's a mathematical formula that's much easier for a computer to do. So symmetric key, the encryption itself, will likely be very secure. The challenge, however, is symmetric keys, those passwords have to be kept private. So if I'm going to use symmetric encryption <clears throat> to transfer something to someone else, how am I going to get them the symmetric key so they can de encrypt it. I either have to do that out of band or the most common thing is I will use a temporary asymmetric key pair to transmit it. So they can give me their public key. I can take this symmetric key for this thing that we're exchanging and encrypt it with their public key and send it over to them. So they're the only ones that can decrypt it. Well, now if I can have a quantum computer in, intercept that conversation, 
factor the public key of the recipient. Now I can see the, the symmetric key that was used and get to the data. So symmetric keys are really resistant when it comes to quantum computers, but now the sharing and the storage and the long-term retention of the symmetric key comes into play of how am I going to do that securely? Because otherwise I'm gonna have one symmetric key protecting another symmetric key, protecting another symmetric key, where, where does it end? So uh, th there's a whole other set of problems that are there. Right. Okay, let's let's maybe do two more questions. Here's one. As 32-bit hardware is rapidly vanishing from servers, clients, and mobile devices, is it time to start using SHA-512? So, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, when we do deployments and, and working with customers, one of the, the major things that we come up with is obviously we're all in the SHA-2 boat and, and the that the primary uh, algorithms in the SHA-2 space, SHA-256, 384, and 512. Uh, technically, NIST right now says the bottom is, is SHA-224. Uh, most operating systems like Windows don't even have a, a 224 algorithm for, for hashing signatures. Um, 256 is, is uh, really the, the bottom of the barrel acceptable practice. You, you, you're, you're not gonna be scolded for doing that, but you're not gonna gain any kudos. Um, SHA-512, there's actually enough rumblings that are out there um, around compatibility. And, and the challenge is most of us don't have environments that are completely new. We, we, we can't point to every uh, appliance, operating system, device, and application and environment and go, you know what, everything here is five years or newer. Um, in, in that case, we can do 512. So when we do things like IoT, where we have a very defined a network of, of devices, things that we're manufacturing, and we have a very good understanding of the cryptographic abilities, SHA-512, absolutely not a problem there. Uh, where we find the sweet spot, SHA-384, um, that seems to have a, a good compatibility, puts us one step ahead of the SHA-256. Uh, but frankly, the, the expectation is honestly SHA-2 most likely will, will be end of life or made um, irrelevant by the, the quantum supremacy issue. Um, but we, we do expect that there'll be a number of years there. Um, you know, NIST is already actively working on replacements for the, the shop because hashing and signatures need to e evolve as well. So when you look at NIST and the, the quantum algorithm selection process that they're going through, um, there are some that are just for encryption and some that are for signing. Um, I think for the time being, most enterprises will get the biggest bang for their buck from SHA-384. I don't necessarily think the heartache of SHA-512 uh, is going to make you necessarily any more quantum resistant um, and, and probably introduces more problems than it's worth for, for most environments. Okay, thank you. So how about this as a last question? This is a good one. Uh, do you think that the first practical crypto breaking quantum computer will be announced or kept secret by a nation state? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, if, if we've learned anything over history, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's ha happening that we don't hear about for, for years later. Um, so, so while we may hear that Google and NSA are, are collaborating on, on quantum computers, um, I, I think we would all be a, a little nearsighted to assume that that's the only uh, government and the only place that things like this are happening. Um, so I, I suspect that there'll be um, some uh, private developments in, in the quantum space um, um, at least several years ahead of what we're seeing in, in the public space. So that, that's why this is a little difficult. Um, you know, in, in getting prepared for this, we can't just benchmark ourselves off of what we're seeing from, from Google and uh, NSA. Okay, well, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us today. This has been very interesting and fun. <laughs> if you have more questions, please don't hesitate to send email to the PKI guy at pkisolutions.com. And we have so many more webinars in the series. So um, check us out and start registering at pkisolutions.com slash webinars. Thank you.